and welcome to this virtual event, the first in Rain Taxi's 2022 Twin Cities Book Festival. I'm Eric Lorber, the director of Rain Taxi. If you don't yet know about us, we are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. And I invite you to check out our website anytime after this event to learn more about our quarterly magazine of critical writing and all the other great programs we produce to help take readers where writing is going, including the upcoming events in this book festival. This event, like most of our events, is free to attend, but if you're able to pitch in a little something, feel free to use the donate button on your screen. Some funding for our festival comes from the Minnesota State Arts Board, thanks to legislative appropriations from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, but our most vital support has always come from individual readers. Whether you're a one-time donor or you'd like to become a member and stay in touch with Rain Taxi year-round, we are grateful for your support. Don't forget there are other ways to participate on screen with us. There's the chat where you can put your comments and observations. If you have a question for our guests, use the ask a question box and we'll get to those toward the end of the event. And best of all, you can buy the book. And if you hit that button today, you'll be taken to a page at our bookseller, Majors and Quinn, where there's not only W, but there are also books translated and written by Saskia as well. So lots to look at. But with this in my hand and with these wonderful people on the screen, it's just my delight to welcome Steve Sem Sandberg and Saskia Vogel. This has been my introduction to Steve's work, and it's been uh, an eye-opener and a mind-blower. This is a fantastic literary novel, a reimagining of the classic work of Wojciech, and, and I would say a deepening and a flushing, flushing out of everything that is that is packed in that story. Um, uh, Hilary Mantel calls Steve a writer of true moral force. I couldn't agree more based on this novel, and uh, very excited to, to have him with us today from Sweden. Uh, what a treat to have the translator of the book, Saskia Vogel, uh, Saskia has become an essential translator of literature from Swedish. Um, I, I look for anything that she has uh, brought over to the English language uh, uh, with anticipation. And um, she, in addition, she has written a wonderful novel that I highly recommend, uh, Permission, and um, maybe that'll come up as well. But uh, for now, I, I'm so excited for this conversation, author, translator, and a magnificent book. Uh, Please join me in welcoming Steve Sem Sandberg and Saskia Vogel. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you so much, Eric. It's such a it's such a pleasure to be able to be part of your festival. Thank you for having us. Um, so, Steve, uh, we had it's we talked about having um, a dialogue about your book, and so I've got some questions for you, and I know you have some questions for me. Um, let me give the audience a little more context about the book. Uh, I'm going to take this from the jacket copy because it's the information that I'm most likely to mess up. So, W, the astonishing new novel by August Prize winning author Sen Sunbari, is a literary reimagining of one of modern literature's touchstone texts, the play Wojciech. It's considered the first modern drama and tells the story of a loyal soldier and survivor of the Napoleonic Wars who, in a fit of jealous rage, kills the woman he loves. So in 1836, um, this true story inspired the playwright Georg Büchner to write the play, unfinished at his death at just 23. And then in this internationally acclaimed novel, um, Steve, and I absolutely agree with this jacket copy, brilliantly refracts the story of Büchner's groundbreaking play, Wojciech, through a new lens. Um, I'm gonna read a tiny, snippet from the very beginning of the novel, just to give the audience a flavor of um, the language, even though the novel itself um, is, I feel like, it is playful and wild in its form with letters from kings and extracts from um, case files and court transcripts and uh, rich and historical detail. But here's, here's, a be here's the very beginning of the novel. Um, and then I'm gonna ask you a question. So. After the fact, during the police interrogation, he could not recall from where the words had come or what manner of voice had spoken them. 
He only said that it had been as if a giant's hand had grabbed him by the chest and flung him to the ground. And the force of this movement had been so, well, how to put it, so dumbfounding that later it seemed like nothing had happened at all, as if the words had not even been spoken. He had arranged to meet Johanna at Funkenburg that day, or rather, he wasn't sure if they had agreed to anything. Last they met, she had come to him, and for the first time in a long time, she had touched him. And she had inquired after the name of the soldier in the city guard whom she thought he knew, and afterwards he asked if she wouldn't also consider going out with him sometime, the evenings being now so light and long. She had directed her slanted lupine eyes at him together with that smile she for some reason so often gave him, amused but with a hint of pity as when one regards a child, and replied that yes, she would like that. All the same, they hadn't made specific arrangements, he said, and the two policemen stared at him uncomprehendingly. One was a constable with thinning hair sitting behind a heavy oak desk, the other a much younger colleague, thin and gangly. It fell to the younger one to take the minutes, but instead of writing, he sat there rubbing his thumbs together and wetting his lips with his tongue as though it disagreed with him to be in the same room as a man who had been caught in the most gruesome of acts. W looked down at his hands. They were no longer shaking. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful hit red. It's such a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you about this book. Um, I mean, we we had some interaction over email, um, but uh, yeah, do you, do you, how closely do you normally work with your translators? Um, was it fairly typical to have just exchanged a few emails or have you done more intensive work? You know, it's, it, it works differently with the different persons, you know, some, with some I have a kind of a continuous chat yeah. <laughs> over several years sometimes uh, with a lot of questions asked and, uh, and um, my hesitant replies maybe to these questions and in some cases it's best to let the translator work his or her own way through the book and not try to interfere or or mess mess with things that's been my attitude all along and i think i think the translator has to decide <clears throat> yeah i think about translation a lot just in terms of making a million little choices and i think about that differently as a writer i suppose it's a similar work but um i think because you're always coming to the to the same printed text um that that uh dizziness that like um vertigo feeling of of, of being faced with so many choices every day is kind of one of the pleasures and terrors of translating yeah, exactly but it's also it's also of, of writing i would say i mean if you if you feel that 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 terror every day is, and and, uh, and and write a sentence you can all also, of course, imagine how the translator feels when he or she picks up that sentence and have to make his or her own choices. So I understand fully well. Yeah, I was um, translating this book in uh, Hessen, which is where Buchner was from, and so it was a really uh, unusual translation because I was like located in in the place. Normally, I don't have the opportunity to kind of be in one of the locations, um, mm. or at least close to one of the locations in the novel. And I thought a lot about um, Wojciech and, and uh, the sort of episodic nature of the novel where we not only get the story that um, was introduced by your jacket copy, but we also, um, we also get, what do we get? We meet him as a boy when he's working as a wig making apprentice. We see W, um, as a servant to a young nobleman with a writing cabinet that seems to contain mysteries of the world. And, you know, I, oh, and also the kind of heartbreaking and humiliating story of um, W carving a peacock, the most wondrous of birds for um, a woman who's captured his eye. Um, and not to mention the incredible passages where you so carefully depict um, and with such intimacy depict wartime during the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. Um, and so I mean this in the most playful way. As I was translating, I was thinking a lot about fan fiction and the sense that 
you know, the sense that this text is written in dialogue with existing worlds and characters and mm. like opening new horizons for well-known literary figures in this case, Bufnus Wojcik. Mm. And so I was wondering, how did you first encounter um, the character of W and um, how did you come to want to write a book using using Wojcik as a touchstone? Well, that's a good good question, really. Um, this with fan fiction, that, that, that really sums it up somehow. I've, I've been, I, I mean, Büchner's play Wojciech, uh, which is, uh, um, if somebody who is listening in now is not acquainted with it, is it's 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 it was not finished during his lifetime, so it exists in many fragments uh, that can be put together in different ways, and it's. Uh, it's quite short, really. It's just 30 pages or something like that. Very intense, very, very concentrated and so on. But that means also that the play can be interpreted in many, many different ways and be put on stage in many, many different ways also. And I think this, this is the play that in during my lifetime I've seen the, mo uh, the most interpretations of. I think I, 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 I kind of summed it up some somehow i think it was 13 or 14 times uh, but the last last one i saw was actually in vienna because i lived in vienna for 11 years and going to the theater in vienna is very easy you just go by a theater and you pick up a ticket and then you sit in the audience and and this actually this 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 void check i saw uh was actually the musical the Robin Wilson and Tom Waits musical, which is really mm, something out of the ordinary, but 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 uh, it was it was quite amazing. But the thing is that when I walked back after this 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 one, uh, I thought back and I, I I remember that I was actually at the premiere of the same musical in Copenhagen in the beginning of the 2000s. Wow. So that kind of the first performance of Wojciech I saw was uh, th this musical with the music, magnificent music, Tom Waits, and uh, the last one, or the, the one before I started to write the book, mm -hmm. uh, was also the same musical. Uh, so that kind of made things start to uh, turn around in my head. And as I said, if there are these many ways to go into and present and interpret a play, then why couldn't I do the same thing? Mm -hmm. So it kind of started out, out as a loose thought. And, and then when I started to, to do the research, what because Bichner himself, he based the play on an actual event. So this is a true crime story, really. Uh, so I understood, uh, understood that there was a lot of material that Bichner didn't use that I could use. And, and, and that's the way things started. I'm really interested in your research um, because the details are just so extraordinary. And I was wondering, I was wondering if I should read a short bit that made a really big impression on me. Would you like that? I was thinking about reading um, a short scene from, from Orland. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Let me, let me find the page. Because I, I was, one of the questions I had prepared was to um, ask you about what ended up on, so to speak, the cutting room floor when you were researching. But it's really mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. to hear that you, you've been picking up pieces of research that um, Buchner had dropped on, had not made you so well it dropped i don't know sure. maybe didn't want to use or, or, or the times weren't right for that mm -hmm. kind of piece to be put in a play i don't know maybe uh i think i think that the i mean it's really very adequate uh to talk about it as, as a fan fiction because because it's something about the character uh Wojciech that really tore down deep down into me i don't know why i'm so fascinated uh with him, but um, we had a, a chat a little earlier, some some days ago, and I I started to think um, about I mean what what can it what can the character of Wojciech be compared with today? Mm -hmm. And I, 
I, I, I, I saw a small, I think it was on CNN or some of those uh, international news channels. Uh, they interviewed a Russian soldier that had been taken prisoner in the earlier mm -hmm. days of the Ukraine war. And, and it was so amazing because he, he, he just stared bluntly into the camera and, he's, and he didn't know where he was. Yeah. Which is really, oh, I was thought, I, I, I just thought we were going to do this exercise. And then suddenly, you know, military exercise. And then suddenly he, he was in the middle of a war. People were shooting at him. He didn't know for what reason. And, and he didn't know if, on what side of the border he was. Where were all these people doing around him? And why were they so so aggressive towards him? Yeah. You know, and, and this is kind of the Wojciech feeling. You know, you have this this poor man. He is uh, has no education hardly. He cannot even hardly write. And the only thing he can do in the beginning of the 19th century is to enroll as in, in, in as a soldier. So he spends um, he spends 18 years in this Ukrainian nowhere land. Mm -hmm. so and he doesn't know what he does. There are many mercenary armies who, who can hire him. Mm -hmm. And he's on the Swedish side, and he is on the Mecklenburg side, and he is on the, the French side, and so on. And, and this is his life. And, and there's something uh, really heart rendering about this kind of character. Because after 18 years, he comes back to Leipzig, yeah. and 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 he wants something. He wants things to be normal, and then his his girlfriend cheats on him. Yeah. And, and he grabs the, the first thing that he can think of, and what is that? It's of course a, a weapon. Mm. Mm. So this is pure tragedy in some way, uh, and and that's what really made made a story for me. I mean, it is it is a hugely tragic book, and I was thinking about these moments. There are these moments of kind of grace and hope and beauty with W where, you know, he has his apprenticeship in the beginning and there's sort mm -hmm. of like a path is opened, but then mm -hmm. it's shut down because he's caught um, masturbating to the woman he later gets, exactly. to, gets to get, you know, murders. Nothing because there's many years between this. Many years, yeah. And, and the later one. And that he's, um, he's sort of captivated by this idea of uh, Freemasons and signs um, and uh, there's also this sort of collision of different ways of knowing in the book. Like when he visits the young, the, the young, when he's in service of the young nobleman, um, the young nobleman has Rousseau as a touch point, and there's this scene where, um, actually, uh, you know what? Can I go ahead and, and read that short little scene on the on the mountain with when they're in the huts? Because it might yeah. actually be really good for um, context. Um, let's see, page eight, here we go. It's just a little short reading. This, um, so this is early in the book. Once or more than once each semester, the medical students make local excursions and W is allowed to be among the other young gentlemen servants. They travel in several equipages to Duvena Haida or the nearby Lakeland. One day, when the autumn is in its fullest glory, they drive as far as to Vedasleben in the Hats by the Devil's High, by the Dahai Devil's Wall, a row of towering sandstone cliffs, the jagged contours of which burn darkly against the slanting but still saturated sunlight. W has retreated to a small hillside away from the rest of the servants and is busying himself with cleaning and greasing tack for coachman Metzka. There's one of those moments where he's always useful and there's always some sort of grace in these um, those sort mm -hmm. of like physical, the physical labor he does in the way that he's always in service to others. It, it's an interesting impulse in his character. Mm -hmm. When the work is done and the students have yet to show signs of parting, he scrapes up a fistful of scree from the ground and engages in target practice with some boulders downslope. In the low lying sun, each stone casts a sharp shadow until they all, shadows as well as stone, slice into each other in sibylline patterns. So engrossed is he in the stones that he hardly notices the much larger shadow now leaning over him. But the young doctor's voice is surprisingly gentle. He is a child of nature, that boyet, because um, he is always named different names in the book. 
This is why I've always found him so charming. One of the young doctor's legs slips down the slope and he allows the unplanned movement to advance into a studied pose, elbow propped on knee. Pray tell, has he ever had occasion to read Rousseau? W doesn't know how to respond or if, he, or if he is meant to respond at all. Pardon, what now? Rousseau? The young doctor also realizes that the addressed can hardly offer a comprehensible reply and turns his gaze to the slope where the party in pairs or groups is slowly making its way to the carriages. The servants have already begun loading the luggage and picnic baskets. Voices and laughter rise up from below as though a bottleneck, as though through a bottleneck. Tell me instead what he, Boyet, sees when he looks out over this landscape, or what he imagines. For images are what we make of them, not a thing that arises from nature itself. This last part is uttered with a measure of bitterness, W thinks. He says nothing, because he is almost sure that a thoughtful silence is what the young doctor is expecting of him. And as if, as if this were correct, the young doctor resolutely withdraws all that he has exposed, hand, smile, and gaze, as when he shuts the doors of his writing cabinet. Then he sets off down slope, halfway to his destination he waves, an effusive greeting at the rest of the party. But the sound of his voice stop mid-step, just like the stones in a rest at the edges of their own shadows. Oh. It's it's such an incredible scene, but also such an interest, such a great illustration, I think, of how different bodies of knowledge function in the book, yeah. which doors yeah. are opened and closed. Mm. Um, you, of course, have written your next book on Rousseau. Um, yeah, it just happened to be, <laughs> be that case, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was published just uh, yesterday uh, in Sweden. <clears throat> Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, do you, do you want to talk to me a bit about the role of um, kind of knowledge and the characters' perceptions in the book? Um, yeah, like the perspectives that are accessible to W and, and how they do and do not shape his life, maybe? Yes, uh, I think that Buechner touched on this also because there's a scene in the beginning of the play when when, when Wojciech, the soldier, and, and a friend of his, his is uh, is in the woods and they are collecting... You know, pieces of wood to use as, uh, you know, to put in the stuff, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they are in the woods, and 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 and, and Wojciech, not my Wojciech, but Bichner Wojciech, he says something like, oh, "Oh, look at all these, you know, um, uh, what's the English word for them? sticks? Uh, no, swamp in Swedish. Oh, mushrooms. Mushrooms. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> mushrooms. Uh, this is the way that uh, writer and translator." <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. Uh, mushrooms, thank you. Uh, they kind of pop up and 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 in different shapes and in different forms and so on. Think, just imagine if you were be able to read this, mm -hmm. what would you find out? You know, which mm -hmm. is quite an amazing piece of perception that this uh, Wojciech character has. Who is considered to be stupid and, and a little bit retarded? Mm -hmm. Ask, can you read the, the the shapes that the mushrooms make when they pop up out of the ground? And and this kind of this 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 was a very important scene for me because I thought that this is the kind of character I want to imagine or reimagine, one that um, is um, if you, you just look at him, you will feel. You would, this is a, a retarded human being, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but but he still has this this enormous sensibility for the tangible things in life, things that you can touch and feel and you know sense. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and to to not be able to communicate this to other people makes him feel, I mean, imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And and this is also the frustration, of course, at least for me, that was the interpretation that makes him so frustrated as a lover of this Johanna, which mm -hmm. woman who he ends up killing because he really feels a lot, but he cannot convey this his feelings. He's mm -hmm. he's kind of trapped inside himself in, in a way that's um, that I felt as a as a writer of fiction, uh, which. It, it was a huge challenge to, to kind of present to a reader a character or a person who is devoid of language 
but I mean, filled to the brim with 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 feelings and and that they cannot express. Yeah. And in the book, there of if if I can just add this small piece in the book, uh, there's this continuous confrontation between him uh, and uh, after the murder has taken place and an interrogator um, uh, who is trying to find out what he thought and what his motives were mm -hmm. and you know all of these rational things that he himself cannot explain uh, and there's this huge void between him and this interrogator who wants to find out the truth, but he has the truth inside himself, but he cannot communicate. So that that's the basic energy in the in the book. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you you also discuss this in terms of um, in terms of uh, layers of darkness, which I thought was a really beautiful concept. Mm -hmm. There's um, actually, there's a tiny little bit. Um, actually, I, I pulled this out from from one of the sections where Claris is like. Uh, the counselor is is yeah. exasperated. He's like, "What voices? What voices spoke to you? What is the nature?" And, and he's so mm -hmm. locked into kind of a binary way of thinking—a a mm -hmm. truth or or a fact, fact or fiction. Did it happen? Did it not happen? What was the very nature of things? Mm -hmm. And um, and there's a comment in this section. Uh, perhaps one should say, "Darknesses are manifold, and the soul is not blind in each and every one." In fact, day and night, light and dark are but layers across which the hours of the day streak like pale shadows. Behind all that we know and what we think we hear and see is an activity hidden to us and sometimes, but then it is often the work of chance or incident, something of all the unheard pushes through to us as signs, we just don't see them. Um, the, the thinking about kind of the nuances of, of the, the relative darkness or lightness of, of W's mind. Um, the, one of the really like resonant tragedies in this book was, I had the sense that there was, there was a life that came to be W as a child. And um, the tragedy like compounds, the humiliation compounds. It's as if the more he engages with society and is marked by the life around him, the mm -hmm. kind of more trapped he becomes um, and, I, and I thought there's this beautiful section where you're talking about a traveling menagerie where there's a um there's this like construction where um wild animals are sent inside sort of like a, like a kind of in my head it's like a ramshackle house of fun with lots of layers like a, no. a cage of terror Mm -hmm. The animal, the, the starving animal is trapped and another animal is sent in to chase it. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking, mm -hmm. the scenario. Well, the crowd wants more and there's someone mm -hmm. in control and, mm -hmm. and nobody's quite satisfied. And I, I felt like it wasn't, that those sections felt like such a commentary, not only on kind of the life of W for me, but also how one can feel so, as in, how the individual in some ways of, thinking, I guess, um, can be seen as just fundamentally trapped and uh, mm. devastated by, by society. Mm. Um, is it also bleak? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That's why this scene is in, in, in the book, I think. You know, well, he, he, uh, yeah, you, you kind of sum it up, yeah, that's it. <laughs> the book is this cage, uh, and he feels his way forward through some kind of darkness mm -hmm. for me for me just to turn the light a little bit um this this theme of darkness is really important because it's it's several kinds of darkness also in the sense that he himself um is does does not know much word words are strange to him he mm -hmm. cannot write he cannot read so, so the world world is reduced to what he can hold in his hand or grab mm hold -hmm. or, or, or be in, in some sort of contact with. But there are also, as you you talked about, the Freemasons, because because of this this um, not having the, the 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 knowledge that we as readers have today. Of course, when we look at his case, right. Uh, um, in hindsight of 200 years or something like that. Uh, 
you, you think that everything he does and everything that everybody does have to be rational, but he's, he interprets the world as, as signs of different kinds. And one of the most difficult things and, and, and challenging things about writing this book was, was try to convey to the reader also this sense of darkness as something real. Mm-hmm. I really wanted the reader to be enclosed in this, in, in, in Wojciech's mind, like in 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 a darkness mm-hmm. that you that you also as a reader when you're getting very close to him you you actually start to get numb in the way that he does because he is not able to c- communicate nobody communicates anything to him he just fiddles around with things you know nobody sees him uh, like in the scene you 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 read about him talking about oh, Literally above his head about Rousseau, what mm-hmm. Rousseau, you know. <laughs> so, so, but, but I, I wanted to get so so close to him that that also the novel would be able to see through his eyes what he saw, so to speak, and that was immensely important to me to to be able to do that. And I felt when I was living in Vienna and writing this, I was completely alone. You know, I I, I sometimes felt that I was really inside him because I didn't communicate much with other, many other people yeah. either so 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 that was the thing yeah. um Steve I want to pick up on um what you said about what you want the novel to achieve because one of the things uh just to give English language readers a sneak peek of the next book you have and 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 the joy that that book promises to be. Um, uh, one of your recent reviews was was really kind of uh, ex- calling calling you like a, a master of the the novel form. That you you're doing extraordinary things with with the novel as a form. And um, I guess I was curious uh, what your touchstones are in terms of the novel, sort of how. I don't know. I guess my question is maybe how you how you've developed as a novelist, or or how you came to novel writing, or mm. your yeah your relationship to the novel. And I, maybe I'm asking what your influences are, but also feel free to interpret the question however you like. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I I guess I could do some name dropping. I, I mean, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, <laughs> I would love to do that. Um, maybe you can see the books. Behind me uh, on the shelf, but but a huge compartment is of uh, novels of William Faulkner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, so um, and what what some of the things that really hooked me as a young kid starting to read about Faulkner, which was for my age probably very advanced at that time, but but I started to read him as quite young, was the, his extraordinary ability to with his novels to build worlds. Mm-hmm. Like, world that you kind of walk into through reading and you're actually there but these uh, worlds are made out of words and his ability to 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 use language to bend language to to form language to i mean to what lengths it goes for example in the sound and the fury to 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 imagine through this Benji character, which is very close to, to my Wojciech in many ways, mm-hmm. because he, he doesn't either have the language and he's, you know, not, not completely grown up, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and there's this scene in the beginning of, of, of Faulkner's great novel when, when he, 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 the Benji character is close to a golf course and people are playing golf. That you understand quite late in the novel, but you heard the first thing you hear, you hear with Benji's ears, and that is the twang, like, you know, sound when the golf club hits the ball. You know, yeah. there's the, all this twanging going around in the head of, 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 of this Benji character. Yeah. And then some the small pieces fall to place, and then you see the golf course, you see Benji you know, crouching in a ditch close behind and trying to collect the bo- golf balls and so on. And, and, and out of this builds this entire world. Mm-hmm. It's, it's amazing. And, and, and this, this is something that, that really um, 
nobody can do this like Faulkner did, but it's it's a close to an idea of what I want to do. I want to get very close to my characters. I want to, as I told you before, imagine things through their eyes and senses. And I want to, the prose itself to be uh, not something like a window that you just can look look through, but but really to be part of the of of of, of the dy dynamic of the of the novel itself. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the language is formed and reformed and, and you know used in, in, in a way that hopefully makes the reader uh, not only read the book but feel the book, see the book, sense the book. That's extremely important to me. Absolutely, and it it's, it felt like you had a um, you made some decisions on the page that. Can only imagine like felt really good as a writer and, and as simply as the the pages where there are a few pages where there's just like a snippet of, of poetry or like a short mm. comment or um and and you know where the novel kind of pauses um i'm struggling to remember what that one one page let let there be singing or let there be there's there's just yeah or the or the snippets of um yeah, the, the, your playfulness with the form, I think, is is really exciting. I think the I, I'm guessing it's kind of an echo of the fragmentary nature of. I mean, do you think it's an? Do you feel it's an echo of the fragmentary nature of the the play itself, or how did you end up? No, 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 like, no. I, I I think that 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 that. I mean, my book is it, it's really a piece of hand fiction in the sense that I. I was so caught up with the character of Wojciech and I wanted to do my own Wojciech. So, mm -hmm. so, but, but, but I had to do it in my own language and, and it's not fragmentary in the sense that Bichner is. Okay. But, 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 but anyway, I mean, we, we're talking now about the languages and I, this is a question I actually wanted to ask you for quite a long time now. How, 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 I mean, you're an author uh, yourself and, and, and your book, Permission, I would assume uh, is uh, your novel uh, is is quite different from mine so uh the thing i wanted to 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 ask you is actually how it felt it, it to 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 as it as both in the capacity of a writer but also as a translator to to work with these this book or or was it different because it has a slight archaic tone to it too, right? Absolutely. I mean, my novel is quite melancholy. It's it, it crosses themes of um, sort of there's a character who's mourning her father. So there's sort of it looks at the the intersection of I guess grief and eroticism, mm. um, among other things. And uh, say that my novel structurally is quite diaphanous. Like it's not. Um, it's not a robust novel. It's a it's a slim novel that's that mm. I, it's intentionally brittle in some ways. Mm. Um, and I think in, in general, as a translator, because I, I feel like I could say this of every book, that the great pleasure of being both a writer and translator is is um, you know getting to explore new styles and and each and and, and to sort of work on myself as a stylist and. Um, your your book was one of the, the most challenging translations because I think it's so far from my own voice. And um, I also translate a lot of like uh, contemporary uh, fictions in present day with strong themes of feminism and, um, and things like that. And uh, this was such a stretch both in terms of research and, um, and the way that your language is 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 so rich like it's a it's a it's a use of swedish that i that i haven't really encountered before like you've, mm. you've remade the swedish language for me and mm. showed me new new um new possibilities mm. um, down to something down to from the vocabulary to the sentence structures and mm. that was really really exciting i love i love that feeling of um i don't know following an author's hands across the keyboards and kind of seeing how mm. they're move and um, well anyway I, 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 I'm a little bit I've just read a few pages of your your translation and I was really amazed how well you 
were able to to translate i mean literally translate this kind of archaic very old sometimes somebody would see say old fashioned swedish into this very fluent and, and but also very in a way stylish uh, you know english polished english really uh, amazed me I, I thought and and everybody who listened into this can could could hear that in the, in the paragraphs you've read so i was really but it must have been a huge uh, challenge and difficulty i can understand that thank you oh gosh it was i mean it was um a lot like where uh where english and swedish couldn't run quite parallel i think my solution was to think about rhythm um you know and so and just to make make sure that kind of cadence was there which of course is a challenge a particular challenge in your book because there isn't just a single voice there's the, there's like a playfulness even from section to section mm. as you move through mm. the different forms and uh to draw, to maybe refer to that i was wondering um should we leave the audience with um a few notes on love um i think maybe i'll read the first three but i think maybe it would be nice to let the audience hear your own um to hear it in the original yeah i can start out with uh, the first three lines in swedish swedish so you can hear the difference <laughs> at least uh the first one reads like this kärleken är ett barn den går barfota eller av vita sockor på den vet inget om trösklar och murar och inget om fönster andra än de som den älskade kan ta sig in genom. Hey, take a minute. Okay. And now the the um the English. So the love is a child. It walks barefoot or wears white socks. It knows nothing of thresholds or walls and only of windows through which the beloved can enter. Love has a laugh that begins in the eyes but ends in the belly. It understands nothing, only that its beloved is coming. The beloved's certain departure cannot love comprehend. Love cannot comprehend that anyone must depart. Which might be a good note to open this up to questions from the audience. Yes. Because everything must come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> Everything but love. Uh, thank you so much. What an extraordinary conversation. I, I, I'm sitting here uh, wishing I could hear a conversation between the author and translator of every translated book that I love. And it's such a treat. Uh, I want to remind our audience, hit that buy the book button. You won't be sorry. This is such a magnificent uh, work. And don't forget, there are other books translated and written by Saskia there as well. So um, just a quick reminder, but yes, uh, uh, there are there are questions. Um, uh, uh, some are, are from the audience listening. Uh, uh, some I've I've gathered along the way as I've been talking about these this book these past weeks. But uh, one out there, and you've you've both al alluded to this. Um, uh, the, you know, this is in a, in a sense a historical fiction, or it's certainly set in a in a completely different time. And as as Steve said, uh, th uh, there's an archaic flavor at times that makes itself uh, present. And uh, so someone is asking, uh, how much do you see the the W character as uh, an example of our psychology, modern psychology, uh, or or how much is his is is he particular to his situation, his historical experience uh, as a soldier uh, uh, at a certain time in history? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think I see him. I, one of the points in the book, in 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 my novel, is that that he is very much uh, um, this this his the whole perception of uh, the interrogator, the counselor. Who asks him questions and and he him replying is pre Freudian. I mean, it's pre psychology. Uh, they didn't understand. Uh, for example, take the take the in, in the, the beginning of the book, the interrogator asks Wojciech, Ah, so you hear voices? Okay, where do you hear the voices? Uh, and he says, in left ear or right ear? 
and, and it has to point to the ear where the voices are heard. Or is it up here and he knocks on on the head of Ojek? Do the voices sit there or do they, as if they were actual voices that were kind of implanted in his head somewhere, you know? And and, and, and this kind of a perception of, of, um, of also of committing murder, not not something you do because things are repressed, or or which is the Freudian way of thinking about it, I would guess, but but because some some moral evil has taken hold of you, uh, almost like a, the devil or something like that, and drives you toward these heinous crimes that you commit, you know. Yeah. So so there's this connection not between. The perpetrator and 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 some sort of immoral figure, some sort of, you know, so 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 that's the that's uh, that's was the I mean the, the the psychological setting I wanted to 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 put this novel in, so to speak. Right, right, yes, uh, yeah. Off the bat, we're a little bit. Um... Uh, oh, maybe I answered a different kind of question, but I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's that's a that's a wonderful answer, and uh, and I think it connects to the form, which which uh, which Saskia so wonderfully um, uh, explained and and asked you to illuminate, and uh, and so I I feel illuminated somewhat already, and but by the hints you've dropped, uh, the Tom Waits musical, what a what an incredible uh, uh, inspiration that must have been, mm. and. Uh, uh, and the anecdote about the mushrooms, uh, it's fascinating, but I think it all speaks to this sort of astonishingly fragmented form that somehow coalesces as a novel. And uh, I was very um, uh, taken with that and wondering, was that uh, unique to this novel or is that a mode that you're often in, in looking for different ways to um, kind of explode the form of what, of what fiction can do? Hmm. No, I, 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 I wouldn't. I, I don't think I would myself be able to explain that. It's just the way I imagine things. It's, it's. They are. I mean, to be a writer working with words, uh, uh, my imagination is really not very um, literal. I, I mean, I, I, I don't imagine things through words. Words is something that comes out as a, as a product of. Or produce, or or something from this. I mean, uh, visual or, or or tactile or sensible imagining imagining of things. So, but I wouldn't be the but I wouldn't be the, the, the right person to answer this. I think. <laughs> um, I think I think that I, I just saw reviews of my latest novel just just the other day and this morning, and I see oh. Ah, this is the way I write, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. the, the others, you can you get a catch a maybe, glimpse of yourself. Maybe that's what, why it's so good. You're you're not overly conscious of of, of what you're doing, perhaps. Uh, what about? Uh, and here's a, 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 one way many readers think of novelists who are willing to kind of interrupt or pause, as Saskia said, their their mm -hmm. their narrative. Uh, is to connect that to the poetic impulse. Is is that a connection for you? Is poetry um, uh, something you you read? Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I, I read poetry. I read uh, all sorts of, of things, um, not only literature. But but um, I'm 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 not reading mushrooms, maybe. But but I'm reading uh, uh, poetry. Yeah, yeah, sure, I do. Uh, and it's an inspiration when it's good poetry, of course. It, it has to have this, you know, uh, yeah, this special thing that good poetry has. Right, right. And then I want to also uh, squeeze in a question, a thematic question here. Um, I, I finished this book thinking uh, that one of the things it's about is how complicated the idea of forgiveness is. Um, and I just wondered if you'd, if you'd, uh, if that was um, a mode. I mean, there's some beautiful passages at the end about, you know, about the, this concept of forgiveness. But was that that a that a, a motivation from the beginning, or is it something you discovered as you as you told this story? 
uh, I, 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 I'm a little bit afraid of using the word forgiveness uh, in in the sense that that it can, you know, there will be some sort of, I think the word for it is some sort of closure. Uh, like a crime has been committed, uh, everybody has been suffering from it or through it, and then comes a point where you can, okay, you can put all these things aside and you say, life is life, God is God, and let things rest, and that kind of thing. I can believe in that, but I, I, to be very honest and frank with you, I think it's a, it's a problem for novelists because they, 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 they become a little bit like Hollywood producers. They have to, you know, make the, 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 the a cut that, that, you know, well, the bells can be clanging and the music can come on and everybody walks through meadows and everything is nice and well and comfortable and so on. And all the ills have been undone. Uh, but of, of, of course, ills are not undone, and crimes are committed, and they, they still are crimes. And, and the thing with my Wojciech character is that he is a murderer. There's no denying that. And, and uh, if you kind of put this kind of closure thing at the end, you will kind of put that aside. But there's no aside putting in, in my moral view of things. And I think that's a, that's a thing that a novel can do. It can keep things open, the wound open, if you want. If there's a wound, you can keep it open. You don't have to heal things. I think that the important thing is to understand things, the motivations, the reasons, the, you know, the complexities of it all. And that's for me, is more important maybe than, than forgiveness as a gesture or, or, or something that, that puts um, an end to things. Yes, well, well, thank you for for that that wonderful answer and 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 that wonderful um, uh, touchstone for why this is so relevant today. Um, I, because surely we have this very conundrum in our daily uh, struggle in the world today. But uh, thank you again. What a marvelous novel, uh, Steve. I hope to get to read many more books by you if if Saskia and her kindred translators will will do that for us English language readers. And Saskia, what a thrill to get to thank you for the work you do to uh, to bring Swedish literature to uh, English language readers like myself. It is um, uh, uh, truly, uh, I know it's a privilege, and I'm 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 grateful for the work that you do, and and I encourage people to uh, to to explore all the rest of what you've done as as well. Um, to our audience, I want out there, I want to say thanks as well. And as we close, I just want to mention that, of course, we have more, lots more author events coming up and lots more in our archive. You can uh, poke around and, and see other great events at any time. We'll put a link in the chat for everything we have coming up in the festival. Uh, thanks again to you both. Thanks to everyone watching. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Bye.